Hello, and welcome to the Coralosophy Podcast. I'm Chris Muntz. This is episode 65, The Art of Community, with Dr. Iona Italia. Shared goals are more important than any other factor when building community. Not shared cultures, shared backgrounds, or shared talents. We just need to want the same things. Choirs are typically a natural breeding ground for this type of shared interest. In this episode, I compare notes with writer, podcast, and tango instructor, Dr. Iona Italia, on the ways we build community in our artistic spaces. She brings her experience living all over the world and participating in many cultures and the common threads in all of those efforts, while I just continue to notice more and more parallels to what we do in group singing. There is a little bit of something for everyone here, including my first E for explicit rating. Uh, Something about Iona just makes me want to take off my filter as well. So you kind of get two different episodes over the course of this uh, conversation. We talk very much at the beginning about concepts around building community, what we think leads to that in both tango communities and in choral communities. And as you can see, as you, you will see when you listen, Uh, there's just lots of parallels between artistic communities that we might look very different on the outside and one is singing and one is dancing, or many of us, of course, in the choir world know that we dance and sing. And so there's a lot of uh, parallels there, but just tons of parallels on different lines too, that you might not think about. And then about an hour in, you are going to hear a second episode where Iona and I start talking about her podcast and it gets us into a, a really interesting conversation about some of our political philosophies and and some of our thoughts about discourse in the world today, online, in real life, and how those things are different. And I just think this was a really fascinating conversation, a little bit different type of a conversation than I've had so far. But again, I will credit that to Iona and her uniqueness, because she you will hear probably within the first 10 minutes how uh, interesting she is when she talks and she starts to explain things. She has a real way with words. So I think you will want to stick around and listen to this whole episode because it's a doozy. Before we get to Iona, just a reminder that the Coralosophy podcast is completely listener supported. That means when you go to Patreon to chip in $3 a month, you're going to get all kinds of extra stuff by going over there, but you're also helping me underwrite the costs of doing this show, which continue to mount uh, as it gets more and more expensive to advertise on Facebook, to store all of my episodes on my website and all of the things that go into the costs and the equipment and production value of a show so that it can continue to be better and better for you. Uh, That's where Patreon comes in. So you go to patreon.com forward slash Coralosophy and you can get in at the $3 a month level and up including the producer level, which has a few spots left. The producers from the Patreon page are Ulrika Igrein Munoz Alarcon, Chandler Smith, David Kowalsik, James Mock, Kyle Peterson, Michael Heron, Ryan Main, and Steve and Kathy Kakachik. And of course, the other way that listeners can support the show is by liking, sharing, uh, spreading the word, telling their friends, and of course, using Coralosophy at checkout at any of our sponsors. That's sightreadingfactory.com graphitepublishing.com, ryanmain.com, mymusicfolders.com, and Voce Vista Video. With no further ado, here is Iona Italia. So Iona Italia, welcome to the Coralosophy Podcast. Thank Uh, you so much, Chris. uh, You are one of my favorite internet people, which I'm not sure if you're aware that you're an internet person. I'm sure. Uh, No, I think of myself as flesh and blood. (laughs) Yeah, I was going to say, you probably think of yourself as a real person, but I'm here to tell you that you are an internet person. I'm I'm teasing, of course. Um, But one of my favorite people to interact with uh, on Twitter. And so, of course, I started thinking, you know, immediately, this would be a fascinating person to bring on my show, a real flesh and blood person uh, to bring (laughs) to bring on my show. And then as we started to uh, converse about things that we could talk about, uh, that would not only be interesting to you and I to talk about, but interesting to listeners talk to talk about. I learned some things about you uh, outside of what I knew about you, which is your connection to music. So we're going to get into that a little bit uh, later. But first, I just want you to tell my audience, in case they haven't come across you, who are you? Where do you come from? What do you do? Oh, my God, these really difficult existential questions. Uh-huh. Where do I come from? Well, Once upon a time, there was an imbalance between positive and negative energy. Um, (laughs) No, um, so I um, 
I'm going to start right at the beginning. Well, I won't. Yes, right at the beginning. I was conceived um, in, I guess, the winter of 1968 um, in um, Pakistan, in Karachi, Pakistan. And I was born in Scotland um, nine months later. My mother was Scottish and my father was uh, Indian Parsi. And he moved to Pakistan in the 60s. Um, and I, um, <clears throat> um, I, I shouldn't have started this, <laughs> I shouldn't have started at this earlier stage. I guess I, um, skipping over some parts, I was, I did my undergraduate degree and PhD in English literature, and my specialist topic was 18th century writers, particularly 18th century essayists. And I wrote a book, uh, which was published with Routledge University Press in 2005, which is called Anxious Employment, a title which has unfortunately become all too autobiographical. So be really careful what you call your first book, because it may have negative impacts on your life. Do not call it Everything Sucks or something like that. Um, it may prove prophetic. I feel a bit superstitious about it now. But it was it was about um, the profession, the, the kind of growing profession of journalism in the 18th century and how journalists saw and presented themselves. And I was an academic for 11 years. And then I, in 2006, I decided to move to Argentina. It seemed like a good idea at the time. I think I'm the only person ever to have given up a tenured academic job voluntarily. Uh, and I went initially on unpaid leave for a year because I wanted to, um, to intensively study tango dance. And then after the year was up, I just did not want to go back again. So I did my life in completely the wrong order. When I was young and lithe and beautiful, I was an academic where, whereby, you know, my body was just this mechanism for transporting the brain from one place to another place. And then just as I was getting older and fatter and less kind of less attractive, I became a professional dancer. Um, and um, I also did that for more than a decade. Uh, I taught tango and I wrote two books on tango. Well, one two part book on tango, which is called Our Tango World. And I had an extremely popular tango blog, very, very popular tango blog. And I became well known in that tiny little scene of people who dance tango for the blog. And for a while I was um, spending most of the year in Buenos Aires, and I was a teaching assistant to a professional dancer. And the rest of the year I was touring. And on the strength of my blog, people would invite me to come and give readings about from my tango writings and also teach. And I particularly taught um, music interpretation and um, music appreciation. And then um, in 2017, I had another, I had a second midlife crisis. We're going on for the third one now. One is never enough. And I um, decided it was time to go to India and reconnect with my Parsi roots. So I went and lived in India for two years, mostly in Bombay. And I lived in the gated Parsi community down in South Bombay. I will explain what Parsis are later, if you like. Okay, yeah. Um, and when I returned, I felt that, I mean, when I was in India, I could no longer make a living teaching tango. I did teach tango in India, and it was very, it was very fun and interesting to do that. But it's a, it's a vanishingly small group of people who dance tango in India. So I had to shift careers again. And I'd started doing translation and copy editing work and also writing some articles for ARIO magazine. And then Helen Pluckrose took over ARIO magazine from its founder, Malhar Mali. That was in August of 2017. And she asked me to um, work as her copy editor. So that was making me a small amount, maybe a third of my income. 
And the rest of my income was making from copy editing mostly and writing some articles myself. And on um, a freelance basis? On a freelance basis, yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I really enjoyed returning to the sort of world of reading and writing. And I also enjoyed the the more cerebral, more intellectual, more kind of in interactions with people that I had in India. India was an extraordinarily wonderful human experience for me. And so when I came back to Argentina, I just did not feel like working as uh, dedicating my entire life to dance anymore. Um, and I decided that I wanted to be in the heart of a more kind of intellectual environment. And I wanted to interact with more of the kinds of the kinds of people with whom I was talking online in real life. Of course, that hasn't happened this year at all, but it is still the plan. And I decided that I wanted to divide my time between the UK and India to go for a few months each year to, to India and spend the rest of the time back here in the UK uh, and reconnect with my old friends from university and be just in a more in less of an intellectual backwater than where I was in Argentina. So I moved back here right before lockdown started. And I had the wonderful opportunity to um, live with friends of mine from college days. That is, that's really an amazing story. And what I find interesting, and I'm sure the listener, as they hear your kind of story from the very beginning, and, and I appreciate that you started at conception because sometimes mm -hmm. we... <laughs> <laughs> we don't like to talk about that about our parents, but um, but yes, and and we hear the the diversity of um, of environments that you've been in in your life, which is one of the reasons that I think you're one of those those really interesting people to to listen to and to now talk to, is because we one of the things that we frequently say uh, is you know diversity among groups of people is important, which of course I agree with, but what's interesting about you is that you have diversity within your own single lifetime uh, in terms of who you've interacted with, what cultures you have connected with. Uh, what is that, what is that like as a, tell, tell a Midwestern white guy in the U S who only interacts with white people. What's, what's, what is that like? Um, I'm being sarcastic. Well, <laughs> <laughs> where are you in the Midwest? I'm in Kansas city. All right. Mm -hmm. I have been right to Kansas middle. city. I've been to Kansas city. I like it here a lot. I had an extraordinary experience there, but I don't know if it's really relevant to your podcast. But in any case, I, um, as in addition to Pakistan, India, the UK, and Argentina, I have also lived in Sri Lanka and um, the US. I lived in St. Paul, Minnesota for three years, oh. and I lived in Los Angeles for a year. And I also had a boyfriend in Los Angeles. I spent a lot of time there during my whole stay in the States. And, um, and I've also spent time in Singapore and Japan, and I've done a lot of traveling in between. So I have, ex I have lived in a fair number of countries. Um, and what is it like? I think one of the things is that I am... Um, while culture is very important, culture differs a huge amount between different countries. So there is a, a sort of privileging of certain types of personalities and behaviors and ways of being that you find in any particular culture. So, for example, in Argentina, the social expectation is that you will be extroverted and sociable and maybe a little bit superficial and jokey and a party animal. And in India, the expectation is that you will be quite calm, subdued, quiet, introverted, thoughtful. But nevertheless, every place has the full range of personality types. And I, um, there are, uh, there are so many surprising connections and similarities and um, and parallels 
in which people are using different forms of culture or different practices to obtain the same kind of experience. And so I'm, I don't believe that race is an important fact is an important factor for most people's experience of life or personality or way of being uh, or way of relating to each other. And I do think sex is important. Um, well, not just the activity, you know, but, biological but sex, that. men and women, but also <laughs> <Right>. that. <laughs> um, but race, I think, is is really insignificant. Um, and I don't feel there are huge barriers to connection. There are culture shock issues, but um, the possibility for very deep and intimate connections is there with people from everywhere. Mm -hmm. Now, what? so what's interesting about that uh, is that, again, going back to this idea of being an internet person, uh, which of course I also say, say sarcastically, but there is a difference in how that, what you just said, which is that race doesn't tend to become significant in those cultural interactions, is doesn't seem to be true when that topic is discussed online. Uh, in other words, there are certain correct ways to speak about that, and there are certain incorrect ways to speak about that. But then uh, maybe, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it seems like maybe what you're saying is that in your experience, having been in all these different places, that on the ground, in real life, when there's eye contact between two people, race doesn't seem to be, be one of those um, culturally determining factors, whether or not a group of people can gel in community. Yeah, not at all. Um, I mean, the, the things that really are the, the factors that facilitate or hinder conversation are, first of all, whether or not you have shared goals. Mm -hmm. As soon as you have shared goals, and that goal can be anything from you want to improve the standard of teaching at your kid's school to you want to play a game of backgammon together. As soon as you have some shared goal, then the, that then you can work together. Mm -hmm. And then those differences uh, become very unimportant very quickly. Um, and also as soon as you have um, shared interests, and there's this weird, there's this weird paradox. I mean, a lot of people, other people have talked about this too, which is that when you are producing art, for example, because I was a dancer for many years and a creative writer, I'm very familiar with this. Um, paradox, which is that the things that are, when you write about the things that are most deeply intimate to you, those are always the writings that find the most resonance. Mm. And it's, so the things that appear like as though they are, there's a kind of, there's a sort of, there's a general homo sapiens layer. And then beneath that in the, un, in the onion that is the person. <laughs> okay, I'm not making any sense today, but never mind. Um, That's okay. We're sleepy. We're having a sleepy podcast. <laughs> yeah. In the onion that is the person, the next sort of layer is your idiosyncrasies. Um, and those those can include things like your skin color, the the accent with which you speak, your native language, etc. And but one layer deeper, you get back into the realm of the universal. So there's really a kind of the idiosyncratic and the personal and the specific is kind of sandwiched between two layers of 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 kind of universal things. Um, if I so I used to get drunk and write these really intimate blog posts um, about my feelings. And it was just extraordinary how many people felt. The drunker I was when I wrote, the more better received my writing was, which is a bit worrying. Um, but I don't, don't try this at home, folks. Um, but the kind of those things that are the most secret to you, the most shameful, the things you really don't want to admit, the things you don't want other people to know about you, the things that feel really part of the heart of your being, 
as soon as you put them out there and communicate them, you find that they have an almost universal resonance. It's really extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Because everyone has those. Yes. And and one of the things that breaks down walls the most quickly in human communication is the sense that you are speaking with the true version of a person. And, mm. and, and that's, um, I think, continuing to go back to this idea of the way that people communicate in person versus the way they communicate on the internet or if they're typing, uh, that's, that, that's a barrier. Uh, and and I, maybe w- when you're drunk uh, p- and then you write, people are feeling like, okay, so maybe she has lost one of those barriers b- that are between Iona and I, and I'm, I'm reading a little bit of the unfiltered Iona here. And, and that makes me maybe feel a little bit more safe that, uh, that I'm reading the real version of you, even though, of course, sometimes when we're drunk, we, <laughs> we, <laughs> we, we say things that maybe are fantastical or, mm-hmm. or whatever, mm-hmm. but I think that's, that's an, uh, an aspect of it. So one of the things that I find very I definitely, no, go ahead. I definitely think WhatsApp should have a breathalyzer. <laughs> you shouldn't be able to, you know, you should have certain numbers marked and you shouldn't be able to text those people unless you've had a breathalyzer test first. <laughs> yeah, that would probably be smart. That would be very <laughs> smart. So I have a couple of questions then from some of the things that you just said. Actually, um, one about tango and what about what you just said, which is that uh, I think, uh, or I guess maybe a reaction would be a better way for me to phrase it, it that when you said um, that shared goals are really more important than any of the other cultural factors in terms of creating community uh, within a group of people. Of course, I, I, my job is to direct choirs. So I put humans together in a room uh, and we have to figure out how to have shared goals. Uh, if I, if the, the singer next to me uh, doesn't have the same idea in their mind of what we want us to sound like, uh, then it is impossible to do what we do. And so uh, so I think that's extremely important. And I think one of the most pernicious things that we do get from internet culture, which I do think is just a totally different culture, um, is that, uh, that all those cultural differences between us uh, cause us to lead with not having shared goals. We're constantly told that we don't have shared goals. Uh, your goal is is not the same as mine because we have a different cultural background and that's what leads us to have our goals. And the, the, the cool thing about what I get to do is that I get to prove that wrong every single day. Uh, and mm-hmm. that's, that's pretty amazing. And then what I found interesting about your work in Tango is that you have been talking quite a bit about how in Tango, that's also not true. In other words, when you are connected with another person in a dance, uh, then you have to also have shared goals. And I found a, uh, there was a podcast you did on Tango. I think it was, uh, let's see, I've got it here on my phone. So I didn't forget the name of it. You, you did a, a talk with on Joe's Tango podcast. Which, oh, yes. Yeah, which of course I never would have come across had I not mm-hmm. been trying to uh, get some ideas for this conversation. Uh, but one of the things that you talked about in there is, uh, I, I loved this. I even excerpt, excerpted the, the clip in case I forgot what you said, but it started with uh, something a lot about everything feels more real to me when I've been heard. And, and then you went on and here, I'll kind of play it for you because I queued it up. But everything feels more real to me once it's been spoken or written. Once it's been Sorry, you're at oh, one and a half times speed. Audience. I can only say this thing I'm dying to say. I only want to say it. I only need to say it if you are there listening and acknowledging it. This is at the heart of the dance for me. Not the physical touching or the beauty of the hug, not even the music. The music gains its significance from the fact that I can share how I feel about it. When you are really dancing, you are not alone. You have a witness. And that makes every... That, that was the part that really resonated with me because of the, the parallels to what I do. Uh, in other words, the in choral music, the music doesn't mean nearly as much to us unless I can share it with you, unless mm-hmm. I can share it with my neighboring singers, I can share it with an audience. It be, it's an academic exercise until you have that connection. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how that plays out in a in a tango community as well. Mm. Yeah. So. Um... Um, the first thing is that kind of one-on-one, one-on-one thing, that that feeling that what you're doing in tango is a, is a very subtle form of somatic 
uh, communication in which in order for the dance to work and work well, you have no choice but to be listening into the movements of your partner's body very intently, especially in tango because of the way that we hold each other, because we hold each other in a very close embrace. It's like a kind of warm hug that you would give to someone. And it's very difficult to move gracefully when you're hugging a person right close to you straight on which is why most in most partner dances, um, you just hold a hand, you have a looser connection between the two of you, so you have space to move and you can manage your own body independently. That's much easier. In tango, um, it's not just that, for example, in, in salsa or swing or something, if I'm dancing swing, swing with, if I'm dancing Lindy Hop with someone and he is not dancing very well. I might find it frustrating. I might be annoyed. He might be off the music. I might feel a little bit manhandled. Um, you know, he might be tugging on my arm or something. Um, but nevertheless, I'm not really handicapped from doing my part. I feel annoyed that he's not pulling his weight and doing his part. <laughs> um, but I, there's nothing to stop me from doing my part. But when you're dancing tango, because you are are so close, physically close, um, which is a really intoxicating feeling that gives you all the oxytocin rush that tango gives you. But because you're so physically close, if you don't coordinate your music, your movements well, you literally can't do your part. You feel as though you can't move at all. Mm -hmm. So um, you are forced to listen. You are forced to pay attention. And um, you're forced to cooperate in a sense. And then in addition to that level of being forced to cooperate, both, both leader and follower, because um, the leader initiates movements and the follower completes movements. So you listen and you feel the small preparations the leader is doing in his body and you respond with your own movements. It's much more intuitive than this. You're not thinking in this way but that's what's happening and then but the leader can't kind of complete the movement until you the follower have gone to the completed end of the movement so it's like two people singing in harmony mm -hmm. you have to be in tune with them um for it to sound right for it to work and if you're not you're if you're not in tune you will get these a uh, horrible that kind of uh beat it beating sound uh -huh. yep you know, when you get amateur recorder players playing, <laughs> there's that kind of, <laughs> right. that like, mm, I don't know how to describe it. That, Dissonance. That sound. Yeah. That's called what, sorry? Dissonance. Right. Mm. Um, it's like all, almost right, but it's just off like this. Yep. By a tiny amount. And you can get that feeling bodily as well. It's like um, two, two recorder players amateur recorder players playing the same note, but they're not blowing with equal strength. And it's just, uh, mm -hmm. I get that teeth on edge feeling as well. When, when the, I don't feel that the partner is with me and with the music. Um, and it's also, there's another element of it, which is that the dance gives you a lot, both parties, a lot of opportunities to, express what you're hearing in the music express in very subtle ways because tango is a subtle dance we don't have a huge range of possible vocabulary movement mm -hmm. vocabulary but um for example when the beat changes from a um a 4-4 four four to a 3-3-2 three three pattern which is is um something that happens frequently and usually only for a few bars and you are walking on this 4-4 um, four, four beat. I mean, just dancers walk on the one and three. We think mm -hmm. of everything in half half speed to what, how musicians think of it. But um, you're walking on the one and three, and then the 3-3-2 three, three, comes. And you just both need to feel it, know it's coming. Um, and music is nicely and helpfully repetitive repetitious always things are always said twice so if you missed it the first time you know it's coming up again in a minute um, and you just 
you can't lead or you can't exactly lead and follow that. You have to just together go to it. And it's like, oh, look, we both noticed this. It's like you're both laughing at a joke together. Um, and sometimes it feels more like there are also these movements that you can do, which we call decorations mm -hmm. in dance, which I think is probably like Adorno's or ornaments in music, um, where there is some small detail going on in the tango music, um, usually not in the in the melody, but either in a fill or in some secondary line. Okay. And it's a little kind of twiddle, a little syncopation or um, or a, a violin um, um, violin improvisation, which is quite common in tango too. Mm -hmm. Everyone else is fully scored and the violin is improvising something over the top, the first violin. And you, it, it's too small and too kind of, deeply buried in there to really lead and follow to it because leading and following you have to do the obvious thing because you can't talk to each other and say let's dance to this tiny little violin thing happening here mm -hmm. um, so you have to be a little bit kind of captain obvious but you as a woman can use your free foot um, to indicate those things so you feel say a triplet coming and you can make your partner feel you tap just the simplest thing, just tapping the floor to the triplet. And it feels like you are on a walk together, on a hike, out in nature, and you spot this beautiful bird. But you need to be quiet because the bird will fly away if you say anything. So you're just kind of grabbing, squeezing their hand like, look, don't miss this. Um, so there's a lot of that kind of sensation of communication um, that is communication through how you feel and respond to the music and what you notice in the music. Mm -hmm. And that really feels, yeah, that that is part of what feels like the witnessing thing to me. Right. Um, a validation. Uh, like uh, your experience is being validated by sharing those little subliminal co uh, communications. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. And it makes it feel, I think that people who don't aren't familiar with tango and have only seen really horrible, like um, caricatured stagey versions, uh, which most people would, would never dance that way. Think of it as a kind of almost dominance, like the man is bending the woman to his will. But um, although you are suggesting things to each other, um, all of the kind of suggestions and movements have to come from what is within the music. Otherwise, if you tap the floor three times and there's no triplet there, you just seem like a mad woman. And um, <laughs> people will, you're just blethering on and people will stop listening. So you have a chance to be listened to, and you also have to be selective about what you say. Your movement has to make sense to what is sounding in the music. So I, that was a very long answer, and I don't know no, if I, it answered what you were No, it's, it's actually, say. so it's fantastic, because I, I was not wanting to interrupt you, because the whole time I'm sitting there thinking with almost everything that you said, is a direct metaphor to uh, to what singing in a choir is. You know, it of course we do it exclusively with our voice and and most choir people would get quite uh, offended if somebody grabbed onto the other, you know, physically. Um but but the so much of what you just described is exactly what we do. In other words, uh, I'll take the one of those last things you said and draw a direct metaphor. If I'm singing uh well, let's say with a group of 12 people, right? I cannot simply sing within my own self, thinking only about what I'm doing. Every tiny little motion of even my lips I'm moving a millimeter, my tongue moving a, a centimeter forward or a centimeter backward, or anything else will change whether or not I'm able to be sympathetic with the other people in the room. And so people who are really good uh, ensemble singers are constantly being forced to make eye contact, make uh, to listen 
uh, you, you know, you, you're using the metaphor of that, you know, listening through through the physical, uh, almost the noises of a tapped foot or the noises of, uh, you know, the, the, the bodies brushing together and, and how that connects with the actual music that's being played in a choir. It's very similar. Uh, it is a dance. In fact, some of the best uh, choral musicians I've ever come across uh, have have tried to make that connection for decades, which is that the, that a choir is a dance. We're just doing it with our face and our mouth and our you know. There's you know quite a few choirs will actually move physically when they when they sing, but it's just uh, it's quite interesting. And I was also uh, hearing some of the things that you had said in some of these podcasts where you talked about the the tango um, as. Uh, referencing the the tango scene also. So beyond just the one-on-one connection, there are these social groups that come together to 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 dance tango. How does that work? Mm-hmm. And and if a person wants to try dancing tango, how do you get into that scene? Right. I mean, if you want to try dancing, you have to uh, tango does have a quite steep learning curve at first. Mm-hmm. You can't just get out on the floor and sort of try, wing it which you probably could, you could with quite a lot of other partner dances, at least at the very early stages. Um, In tango, you're really not going to be able to do that. So you have to begin with lessons. And then most people- Kind of like what choir, kind of like choir. Mm. You've got to know Mm. how to sing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I used to sing in a choir actually as an undergraduate at Cambridge. Oh, cool. Um, Yeah, a long time ago. Um, But, it's, it's um, yeah, you have to start with lessons and with a certain degree, you need a certain degree of competence before you can go out and dance socially. Because when you're dancing socially, you'll have other things to worry about, particularly for leaders, the floor craft, you want to not be bumping into other people. And so there's a degree of kind of control over the body that you're going to need. Um, and um, so in uh, in many cities in the world, if you just look up Argentine tango, uh, if you look up Argentine tango in Kansas City, I have actually danced tango in Kansas City, so I know there is or was. I'm sure there still is a tango group. And then you can find out when they have classes and when they have events. They're called milongas, the tango events. Um, the 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 place where there are the most I mean, there are certain places which have a lot more, a, a much more developed tango scene than others. Mm-hmm. And of course, Buenos Aires has the most developed scene. Not right now. It's complete lockdown for more than a year. There's been no dancing. Um, but uh, also in Seoul, there's a big scene. In New York, there's a big scene. It's not as nice as the Seoul and Buenos Aires scenes. Um, None of the American scenes are really as pleasant. Mm -hmm. Um, The best American scene is in San Francisco. So if you become really serious about dancing tango, you'll be moving from, um, you'll be moving from Kansas City down to the Bay Area so that you can get your proper fix because that is definitely, um, the Bay Area is definitely the best place to dance in the U.S. Interesting. Um, uh, sorry to I, interrupt. Sorry. Yeah. So I, could you tell, uh, sorry, <laughs> no, it's okay. Detail. No, it's okay. So, what is, but once you've found a scene and here's, this is the part I'm really the most interested Mm -hmm. in is uh, socially, what is that like? In other words, does that become, uh, does that tend to be where friendships develop? Is it, does it, is it truly a social scene or is it just let's show up and dance and then go home? It depends on the size. So I think of there as being tango scenes and tango communities. And the difference between a scene and a community is simply size. So in Buenos Aires, it's huge, and therefore you show up and dance. But of course, since people tend to have their particular milongas that they go to on particular days of the week, and they show up there week after week for years and years, it begins to feel more like a home. But there is not that much talking that goes on. You're mostly there to dance. Um, So... um, And it depends on the event. There are some that have a much more casual kind of party feel where people go to hang out with their friends and do some dancing. And there are others that are very serious. You're shown to your set seat and you sit there and we invite each other to dance via eye contact and a mime. Um, So you then look around the room, you find the, you find, for example, the man you want to dance with 
and you look at him and you wait for somebody, I mean, it can be either party actually to make a small, usually the man to make a small signal and then you agree or you just let your eyes drift elsewhere if, if you know, it was a mistake and you actually don't want to dance with him. Uh huh. So, um, and then you meet in the middle of the dance floor, you dance and afterwards you go back to your seats. So, so some of them all, have this. Is that all learned just by watching other people? Is that, does someone explain this to you at a, at a class prior? How does that yeah, work? Yeah, usually it's explained and taught. Ah, interesting. Um, but you can also learn it from observing and, um, uh-huh. and they often have codes of behavior printed out. Uh, and people are always talking about the correct codes of behavior. So in many tango scenes, asking someone to dance is considered extremely gauche uh, because it puts the other person in an awkward position if they want to say no. Right. And it also, people have are extremely fussy about who they dance with and when. So if I'm, if you're looking at me to try to dance and I'm not responding, Maybe it's it could be because I want to dance with another man who I know always leaves early and I want to make sure I get in a dance with him before he goes. Or it may be that the different tango orchestras have very different feels and some people are a lot better at dancing to some orchestras than others. So it may be that I don't want to dance with you to this very playful music because you are not that playful, but I would like to dance to you to a more dramatic music because you have a lot of, I feel you have a lot of passion in your dance. Uh Um, Or maybe you are not so skilled and I would rather dance to you to more, to simpler music, the earlier music from the 1930s, which is easier to dance with and dance to. Um, Or maybe you are my absolute favorite dream partner. And therefore, because people tend to dance with each other only once over the course of an evening for a set of four dances, which is about 12 to 15 minutes. So maybe you are my absolute dream partner. And therefore, I'm waiting for my favorite music of all to try to dance with you. Uh So there's all these kinds of reasons. Um, or maybe, you know, my girlfriend or boyfriend is jealous. So, and they're there this evening. So I won't be able to dance with you until next time when they're not there. Um, (laughs) (laughs) um, There are, there are a lot of, um, a lot of calculations going through people's minds and it all happens very fast. And it's also a very efficient way of when you have a crowded room of people and you want to spend as little time as possible finding partners, asking and doing all of that rigmarole and, you want, and as much time as possible going out quickly out onto the floor, mm-hmm. then it's very efficient to just sit people around the edge and use the eye contact. That Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, but it's really interesting to just pick because I've never been in that environment. I'm, I'm thinking in, in vocal music and group singing, um, one of the things that also happens is that uh, singers as they become more technically proficient and accomplished and professional also kind of become more choosy and picky and kind of snobby about who they will sing with. Mm, yeah, um, yeah. And, and it could even be, uh, you know, uh, I don't want to sing for that director because I'm more comfortable singing in a in certain style. And I know he's going to ask me to do this other style, or maybe there's a genre that I feel more comfortable with, or maybe there's just a uh, personality problem where I don't want to sing with that person. Is that, is that something you see in tango too, where like the really good dancers kind of get snobby and they only want to dance with other really good dancers? Um, absolutely. And mm-hmm. I think it's, I think it's very valid. I mean, I think it happens in every skill. You know, my boyfriend plays chess. He doesn't want to play chess with me because, <laughs> um, you know, if the game will be over in four minutes, right. it's not interesting. Um, and I mean, in singing, I experienced that. I experienced that too. I I've got to the stage now where I feel I wouldn't want to be in any choir that would allow me to join the choir. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that before from other people. That's interesting. <laughs> um, because they would have to be pretty terrible if they were willing to take me, and I don't want to sing with a terrible choir. Um, you know, my best friend, who is a professional musician, he does not want 
he does not want me to sing around him really um whereas other people who are who are more relaxed don't mind because i really like singing but i'm not that good um and uh, you know the thing in tango this might relate back to the identities again because in tango the um your race nationality skin color even age, uh, um, for for women at least, age and looks, men are a little more fixated on looks. Um, but for women, your looks, your age don't matter at all. And definitely your nationality, ethnicity, skin color, none of those things, no one gives a fuck because, oh, sorry, I don't know if I can say fuck. It's okay. Speaker. It's okay. Uh, mostly, mostly people who listen are grownups. It's all right. Yes. Okay. <laughs> And I think children can also hear the word fuck. I mean, <laughs> um, it's uh, what they want is a joy, a blissful experience on the floor. And because you are holding the person so close and you have, you have not a great deal of kind of complete independence of movement you do have to do your own movement you're not pushing pulling or carrying each other but you have to you're dependent on the other person doing their part well mm -hmm. or reasonably competently and you're also really close to them like your face is touching their face um and we usually dance for 12 to 15 minutes at a time with the same person mm -hmm. so um as a result, people are quite choosy about who they want to dance with. And if you are dancing with someone who is a bad dancer, it can be physically uncomfortable. Um, actually, being a dance teacher was not good for my body. You mm. know, I, really, I had a lot of backaches and other problems because I was dancing with many beginner men, um, you know, teaching many beginner men who were were who hurting me, basically. Uh -huh. um, and then also, if the person is not, um, their musicality is more important than technique. There's no doubt about it. Um, so if the person is a bit uncomfortable to dance with and a bit kind of wobbly and, you know, it's not, the moves don't feel as smooth and effortless and beautiful as they can feel, um, but nevertheless, they have you have the sense that they are deeply connected to the music, then that is an, an enjoyable experience. Vice versa, the person's technique is extremely slick, but you don't feel that they're just kind of walking through in the pulse and putting a pause at the end of the phrase and there's kind of nothing else to it. There's no like flavor to it. Um, that just feels incredibly empty. It's like mm -hmm. acrobatics. And that's when um, women in particular will say, this man is deaf, is a criticism you hear very often. I'm not dancing with him, he es sordo, he's deaf. Um, and that just feels, um, oh, when that happens to me, I'm just kind of mentally counting down the seconds for this thing to be over. Yeah, I, I can identify with that experience in, in group singing as well. It's interesting. It's just so fascinating to me. I, I, okay, so I have another question now about some of these dynamics because one of the one of the stereotypes in my world is that is how frequently people who sing in a choir together uh, at some point along the way will create romances, fall in love, get married. Uh, I met my wife singing in a choir. Um, and, and it's, it's almost a joke to us of how frequently that happens. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and what's interesting to me about the tango situation and the tango scene that you're describing is my personal experience with dance has only been the only reason I ever would have danced was some kind of sexual connection with a woman who, or in, or social situation where I'm, I'm either hoping to date her or, um, and, and so what, what I'm assuming in the tango scene uh, is that you you would obviously dance with people who aren't a, a romantic interest to you, but does that also lead to sexual connection because of the intimacy of that act in, in a very similar way that singing together sometimes causes us to connect emotionally and then that leads to other, you know, uh, romantic connections later? Is that something you see? 
Yes. So just like singing, it needn't lead to a romantic connection. Right. I mean, we we hold each other in an embrace, which is the same embrace that, that you use with a new lover. Um, you know, and it's it's much more intimate, actually, than dances like merengue, where you have groin to groin contact. In tango, you very rarely have, um, you don't have a groin contact. Um, but that feels just more romantic because when you're meeting a new person, you don't go up and grind your groin against them. I highly recommend <laughs> not for, doing this. Speak for yourself, Iona. <laughs> you know, we don't want too many lawsuits happening. Um, you go up and you place your face close to their face to hold them, kiss them, and you hold their hand. And this is exactly the same kind of thing that you do in tango. But of course, there are many other ways to hug a person, to very warmly hug a person. Um, it's it's a it feels like a general gesture of affection and that can feel like a, a fam a familial or friendly affection or it can feel like camaraderie like two climbers sharing a rope or something like being on an adventure together mm -hmm. so it needn't feel romantic but it often does and i think that it's it's not it's not Re it's not kind of the the embrace the sort of the the embrace is not a real life hug i mean if you if you stood there hugging a woman for 15 minutes if for 15 minute stretches at a time in silence very close with your face touching her face that would be really intense yeah um and the music and the dance gives you a space within which to do that which can be a kind of healthy way of expressing your attraction to people and enjoyment of their proximity without any um without any um any pre-commitments um and with plausible deniability Mm. So it it can have that sensation. It's also um, the plausible den deniability also, of course, comes from the fact that you don't necessarily dance with a person in order to embrace them. You might also embrace them in order to dance. You really like this music. Um, this person is a very skilled dancer. You don't find this person attractive at all, but you really want to dance with them. So because it's there is always the ambiguity of which it is that provides you with freedom. And it provides you with a kind of guilt-free way of just being, feeling sort of quasi-sexually close to many people um, in a way that I think is very, is healthy um, because it doesn't, there's nothing riding on it, usually nothing riding on it. But it's, um, it is also, I mean, the professional dance scene is the most volatile and turbulent. Actually, when I told this to my shrink, I said turbulent. He said, do you mean slutty? Um, so I guess I do mean slutty. It's the most slutty scene um, I, have, I have experienced ever um, in that there are people's relationships have a huge, uh, have a very high degree of churn. And I think it's rather similar to actors. So dancing with someone is like, um, it's like playing Romeo and Juliet in a play. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of similar in a sense that you are not necessarily, your uh, Romeo is not necessarily a man you are in love with or have has a have a crush on, but it's sort of kind of whoever the director has has cast in the role in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, and you're speaking the line. So you're you're going through the motions and you're creating a simulacrum, a kind of reminiscence of of the sort of the movements of intimacy, the the postures of intimacy. Yeah, you read but my mind. You read my mind. That was what I was about to interject was the simulacrum or uh, you're simulating those intimate uh, acts and yeah. it causes in our mind to think about what would this be like? It's and, re it reminds yeah. you. Uh -huh. It's not the thing itself. It reminds you of the thing. Yep. And 
As a result, just as actors notoriously are always falling in love on set, um, it both is real and it isn't real. And it's, um, I've actually written a piece about it. In fact, would you, would you like me to read a piece? Sure. Uh, here we go. So I'm describing here my long-term dance partner in Buenos Aires. And at this point, we were both in relationships with other people, not with each other. Um, and I call him, I don't know if this comes up in this piece, but I call him the slow Semite. So I gave people pseudonyms for my, my, um, my blog, and I called him the slow Semite. He's Israeli, and he's very fond of dancing in a really luxuriously um, leisurely manner. So it's called Dancing with My Girlfriend's Boyfriend. I'm going to skip the first part and start about a third of the way through. I've spent most of my adult life in long-term relationships, and my boyfriends have always had their own connections with others, their tennis opponents, their drinking buddies, their female best friends, their pianist accompanists, their famous favorite dance partners. So no, I don't feel guilty at all that right now when I happen to be single, I dance with so many other women's boyfriends, husbands, and lovers. Tango is a way of communicating with, collaborating with someone else. But is it really more intimate, more sexual than other ways, such as playing sport, singing in a choir, <laughs> having heated debates, co-authoring a book? because it is by nature a coupled activity or because it involves physical contact. Perhaps to some degree, but not so much that it makes sense to shut out others to try to corral and control and restrict your partner, unless you both agree that you want to only dance with each other, a rare occurrence in my experience. The tango embrace is a very unusual thing. It mimics the appearance of real life affection. Perhaps if you are a very jealous person, you shouldn't watch too closely, just as you might not want to watch your actor boyfriend rehearse a love scene. You hold another person close to you for a length of time which would have all kinds of implications outside a dance context. If you gave someone four long consecutive hugs of three minutes each without moving, and they happily let you, well, things would probably get pretty steamy quite speedily. But as always with touch, context and intention are everything. We don't necessarily embrace because we are longing to touch each other. We don't necessarily dance because we want to snuggle. It feels snuggly at times, it feels sensual, but that's the nature of the dance. It's not personal. Our intention, our wish, is to dance. The focus is not on us. We are not a couple, meaning my dance partner and I. And we certainly wouldn't hug each other for three minutes at a time in any other situation. Tango is a liminal space between sex and art, but almost always situated deep within art side of that boundary. Its relationship to the sensual often feels less like raw attraction and more like an illusion to romance. You feel like a student actress reciting Juliet's lines to whoever the director happens to have cast than like a happy girlfriend walking hand in hand along the beach with your lover. The sensuality, the intimacy isn't fake, but it isn't real either which is why I can dance in close embrace with other women with great enjoyment, but cannot have sex with them, which is why, why a friend of mine guiltlessly dances with his sister, which is why most people are monogamous in their love lives, but dance with a wide variety of people at the Malonga. We need the bumper sticker that says, tango dancers do it all night long, changing partners every 15 minutes. <laughs> Sublimated into art, we can take something that is usually exclusive and without getting rid of all its eroticism, transform it into something that can be widely shared. It's a magical mutation, a midwinter night's dream, a topsy-turvy approach, a land of lavender's blue, lavender's green, 
If you are king, then I will be queen. I'm not threatened by this when I'm in a couple, and I'm not guilty about it when I'm not. It's subtle, hard to explain to non-dancers, but fundamentally both innocent and deeply life-enriching. Wow, okay. that's it's beautiful. That's beautiful. Thank you know, you. and the, I'm thinking, uh, again, continuing to think about the uh, this, this from the art uh, perspective of, you know, that is what art does for us more broadly too, beyond just the dance, beyond tango, beyond choral music, beyond, you know, any other specific genre of art. It, it allows us to put ourselves in situations as a simulacrum, uh, and, and almost like different jackets in our wardrobe. It allows us to try on those, uh, those emotions, try on those mm. scenarios, try on those uh, philosophies. And maybe then we'd take it off and, and we go do something else. And in choral music, of course, we, we have the addition of poetry with the music. And so it allows us to uh, try on, you know, the, the ideas of Keats and then take off that jacket and try on some Shakespeare. And then, you know, some of the different themes that might be might be discussed there. And so I think that's a I mean, it's just a beautiful thing. And it's one of the things that I find the most interesting about being an artist uh, is that I don't have to um, keep keep that jacket on forever. I can take it off and put it back on almost like being a chameleon. And so there's just so many interesting parallels there. And, and your writing, of course, is beautiful. If anyone who hasn't had a chance to read Iona's writing just needs to go seek it out and. Uh, and find it, um, which is, uh, I, I really, and I really mean that. I think it's a, um, it's always, I don't really care what you're talking about. I just find it interesting. Uh, oh, and that thank has to, you so much. well, it has to do with the way you think of words and the way you conceive of language. Um, and of course that would be a totally different podcast. We could probably do a whole, <laughs> a whole conversation on that. Uh, but so I, I really appreciate that. And that, and I'm really glad you read that. Um, before we go today, um, would you please tell us a little bit, because I really think, again, my, my listeners should seek out your writing, but also should, should go check out your podcast. Could you tell us a little bit about two for tea and what you do there and why someone should listen to it? Yes, yeah, sure. So, um, my I have a weekly podcast and um it is it is uh paywalled. Um so to listen to full episodes you need to sign up to the Patreon. Um it's very inexpensive. I mean you can sign up from one dollar a week at uh, one dollar a month um rates onwards. Mm -hmm. So it's 25 cents per podcast. Um but I want to get people kind of on board and it's um I basically um I'm about to be taking over as the editor in chief of ARIO magazine on the 4th of May. So it's going to become the podcast of the magazine, but nevertheless, it's a podcast where I talk to whoever I want on whatever topic seems interesting to me. Uh -huh. um, and I have, um, so I have talked to philosophers like Jonathan Haidt, Jonathan Rauch. Um, I've talked to, free speech advocates like Keith Whittington, Greg Lukianoff. Um, I've talked to novelists like Ewan Morrison, Rebecca Christiansen. I'm talking to, um, about to interview um, Ashok Chris on Indian, the art of Indian cookery. Um, I've talked about, um, I, I, I've talked about science uh, to people like Sean Carroll, um, Sean B. Carroll, the, the, um, um, evolutionary development guy. Okay. And um, I've talked quite a lot about evolutionary biology on the podcast and also about politics, about things like uh, the political situation in Malaysia was one episode. Um, and I've talked also, I talked to Amy Alcon, who is a relationships kind of guru. Um, it's a it's a it's a very wide range of topics and a wide range of guests, and I've really had some incredibly fantastic uh, guests on the on the pod. Um, I agree. So <laughs> I can vouch for I can vouch for that. I love listening. And I try to have a. I mean, I always, at the very least, I read the most recent book that the person has read. Most of my guests have written a book or written a book recently, 
and um, and do enough research that I can have an informed conversation with them. Mm-hmm. Now, so do you do you do you do the model where uh, people can listen on like a to a snippet of the episode if they're not yes. on the Patreon? Yes, and there's then... a shorter there are shorter versions that you can listen to if you want to see what you think, mm-hmm. and there's also a large back catalog of free episodes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you made that switch not too long ago. Yeah, to... not very long ago. Right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yes. Well, I, I, I'm a big fan. And like, like I said, I, uh, I really appreciate your thoughtfulness and uh, way of explaining things to people, which, uh, you know, one of my favorite things about having conversations like this is uh, we underestimate sometimes how much two human beings with almost nothing in common can can still connect and have interesting conversations, learn from each other. Uh, it's one of the things that one of my philosophies that guides this show, and I appreciate that you uh, you seem to share that philosophy in 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 the by by evidenced by simply who you will talk to and and what you will talk to them about uh, doesn't seem to be limited to your own personal experience, and I think that's a really good example to set. No, I really enjoy building bridges, so. Um... I enjoy talking to people with whom I have. I don't enjoy debating or um, disagreeing with people or arguing with them on the podcast. I have had one or two guests that I have argued with, um, but mostly I don't argue, but I do enjoy taking a person who is politi- whose politics I may disagree with quite a lot and focusing on, on a point that we do agree on. Mm-hmm. And I think I've become very good over the years at, at doing that. Um, I think that of of the people who are in the kind of ferociously anti-SGW, anti-woke kind of corner of life, which I am definitely not a fan of social justice uh, politics, and ideology, um, I think I probably have, um, a, I'm one of the people with the most kind of a, a, the largest number of woke uh, uh, friends because I... Um, Politics is complicated and people are just doing the best they can to work out what is the the right thing to think. And um, of course, they're wrong. They just need to follow what I think and then it will be simple. <laughs> um, <laughs> but there is there are many aspects to a person and there are always um, there are always things that are worth making common cause on mm-hmm. or almost always. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I agree. I, I think that there, there are, there is so much room to be able to acknowledge the, I guess you use the example of, of woke versus anti-woke. And that's something I actually talk about because in the choir world, we are very sensitive to that probably due to the fact that we are largely educators who are very politically mm. um, um, monolithic you know, mm-hmm. across the planet. Yeah. Um, Sadly. If, if yeah. Monoliths are not good. Right. If you're an educator, you you can almost be predicted down to, you know, 20 or 30 different political opinions and we all share them. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, and I'm, I'm weird because I disagree with everyone about everything. Like mm-hmm. that's just, you know, I don't care which side you're on. I disagree. I can tell you ahead of time. I disagree because I like to think about things like one of, one of my biases is that if I see lots of people starting to all share the same opinion about something, I immediately become suspicious. Um, that like what, what type of, um, feedback loop is happening, causing everyone to see this super complicated thing all in the same way. Because to me, that's not natural. That doesn't happen in nature. Uh, it's something that's being imposed upon us. So I like to think about those types of things um, as, you know, I'm, I'm going to acknowledge that you, uh, if you're a social justice advocate, that those things that you're concerned about are worthy of concern. Uh, and I'm willing to have that conversation with you Uh, I might not agree with how you choose to solve that issue or how you would choose to address that issue, or maybe I just want to suggest a different way to talk about it. Mm -hmm. So for me, I'm more interested in the rhetoric of it. I think sometimes the rhetoric causes us to uh, disagree about things that we wouldn't otherwise disagree about if we just talked about it. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I'm very much a universal liberal humanist. And I used to think that the liberal part was the most important or the humanist part. And 
Now, I increasingly think the important thing is the universal part. And there are, I was using the three layers of an onion metaphor, but there are also three kind of lenses, I think, through which to see things. And there is the, the astronaut's eye view, the blue and green, mar all these like little creatures trying to uh, live on this blue and green marble brushing through space. Mm -hmm. And there is the close up individual view. Um, of the of the person before you in all of their complexity, and um, I think that th those two views can both give you a very clear uh, understanding. It's the middle view, which is where you're not looking at humans anymore. You're looking at groups, and groups are an abstraction, and you are therefore fitting your own kind of stencil of group expectations over the top of the people, mm -hmm. that's when you really can't see the trees for the forest. Um. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I have an episode actually of uh, seeing the, called seeing the forest for the trees where I go into uh, uh, quite, quite a bit of detail explaining how forests don't exist. And um, the, 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 the analogy of course is very similar here where, um, you know, again, I acknowledge when people try to talk about, uh, group aggregate data about a social problem and that that social um, aggregation does tell us important things. Like we should want to know if a group is being disadvantaged uh, over time and, and in certain places and, you know, that kind of thing. I think we want to know that. Uh, but the problem is it doesn't tell you anything at all about the individual person you're looking at and talking to. And, mm -hmm. and that's where people go wrong is they, they think that because they know something about a big groups situation, that they know something interesting at all about the person, the individual that they're talking to. And if we could figure out a way to just to keep those things separate um, in our minds, then I think a lot, of, again, it's, it's rhetorical. Uh, that if, if, if I want to have this conversation with you about this topic, um, can't I just say, Oh, I'm just talking about group averages right now. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So group averages. Yeah. We're going to talk about that. Oh, but now I'm going to talk about how my experience doesn't fit with that. And yet people bristle uh, mm -hmm. when you try to separate those things. And it's bizarre to me. Yes. It's very bizarre. It's very dulling of empathy. It's, mm -hmm. I mean, I think the whole, the notion of privilege is very dulling of empathy. I mean, discrimination is, is, I think the right way to frame it is to think about removing discrimination. Um, because as soon as you begin to think of a person as privileged, you lose sight of the human because the human involves suffering. I mean, we all, well, with luck, touching wood, we all grow old, we die, we get ill, we die, we see our loved ones die. It's um, even people who are extraordinarily wealthy and uh, prosperous, um, have suffering in their lives. That is the human condition. And to sort of say, well, this person has this label slapped on them, which is privilege, and therefore it's invulnerability, is very, um, um, it's, I, I find it very dehumanizing and simplistic. Yeah. I mean, we're all going to, we're all going to die, shit our pants, and then rot. <laughs> so ultimately, uh, well, I'm not going to rot because I'm a Zoroastrian. I want to be eaten by vultures after death. Really? Yes. Is that in a literal sense? Sorry? In Literally, a literal yes. sense? Yes, yes. Oh, how do you arrange that? Do you have to hire the vultures? Um, well, you need to be you need to die in Bombay, which is a little inconvenient, but I'm gonna <laughs> get on a plane when I feel it's uh that at that stage and your your the bodies are laid out in a tower of silence to be eaten by vultures um so you return to the cycle of nature interesting um, soaring up to the heavens in the bodies of birds wow the stomachs of birds it's wow. a very beautiful i think it's actually a very beautiful tradition but yeah, I, I mean, it's, yeah, I've just never heard that before. That's interesting. I, I, I am, I've heard you say that you're Zoroastrian before, but I've never heard that part of it before. So that's, mm. yeah, that's really interesting. Um, so uh, Iona, I, like, I, I could probably talk to you all day, um, but this is, this has been really fun. I appreciate you being open and vulnerable, vulnerable about all of these things as I, um, 
I think that that tends to make the most interesting types of conversations. And I, mm-hmm. and I knew, I knew you would, cause I've heard enough stuff that you've talked about <laughs> that you, you don't, you don't have much of a filter on the internet, which I really appreciate. <laughs> Yeah, no, I really don't have a filter. <laughs> yeah, and that's admirable. And I think what's interesting too about that and on, on our way out is I just think that uh, people do tend, this kind of, we talked about this almost right when we signed in was that people tend to gravitate towards what they see as the authentic version of a person. And that's mm-hmm. one of the, as a podcaster, and I've been doing this, you've been doing it longer than I have. I'm only about two years into this and um, the, probably the most common positive type of feedback that I get from the show that I do is that it's, it, it doesn't seem like people will say, tell me that it doesn't seem like you're putting on a show. It's just mm-hmm. uh, two people having a talk, like just talking. And, and, we, uh, and the fact that so many people give me that feedback, almost it, like I'm glad, but it worries me in the sense that that indicates that we're starving for that, uh, that human humans seem to have to go seek that out because it's not part of our everyday life anymore. Yeah, I really resist the the corporatization of the whole of life. It's one of the reasons why I am so against the kind of cancel culture thing is that I think you need a space to be yourself, to think aloud, to play with ideas that might turn out to be bad ideas. Mm -hmm. Um, And to not, as they say on Twitter, have to read the room you know, it's not ev- not everything is about branding. Um, mm-hmm. You should be allowed to say "fuck the room." You know, I want to say what I actually think and feel, mm-hmm. and I might be wrong, and there- therefore it can be corrected as we go along. But there's those kinds of freedoms are very important. Otherwise, it's all just slick corporate kind of advertising, and that's right. so empty. Right. Absolutely. Well, Iona, I appreciate your time. I'm going to go and uh, coach my son's baseball team today. So that's one of my th- fun things that I get to do. He's nine and he is uh, just super excited that his dad is the coach. So I've got to go get ready for that. Oh. <laughs> thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. I told you it was going to be a doozy. Thank you for sticking around at the end of an episode. As always, that means you probably at least found that interesting. I don't know if it made you mad or made you glad or made you sad, or really you found it helpful unless you tell me. So it's really important that you reach out so you can have conversations about anything you heard on the show at the Coralosophers Facebook page, uh, or you can just send me an email, coralosophy at gmail.com. There's also a form on my website. Uh, which is a little bit more private than social media uh, and a little bit less formal than an email where you can just drop uh, comments in and I can either address them on the show if you want me to or not. Uh, And there's all kinds of ways to get in touch. But ultimately, the best thing that you can do as a listener is to be part of the conversation. And I love to hear from people. So please do that. Even if it means you heard something that you didn't like or you disagree with, uh, those are all welcome Uh, bits of feedback. And then of course, on the way out, just reminders to head over to vocevista.com, Sight Reading Factory, Graphite Publishing, ryanmain.com, my music folders. And when you buy something from those awesome coral companies, you can use Coralosophy at checkout and get a discount for yourself. And it helps me a lot as well. Plus, as always on your way out, like this episode, share this episode, smash the subscribe button, hit the reminder bell, whatever it is that YouTube people and podcasters always say, you know what to do because it helps a lot. And that is true. We all say it, all of us podcasters and YouTube people, because it's real. It makes a huge difference. Thanks a lot. See you guys later.